you are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take on the Feast of St. Anthony of Padua. We know him as the patron of the poor, of sailors, of fishermen, of priests, of travelers, and of mail delivery, the wonder worker, and most Catholics on hearing his name immediately pull up the mental image of a young, tonsured, brown-robed priest of gentle demeanor holding the child Jesus in his arms, or preaching to the fishes, arms stretched out over the water. Two beloved and iconic tales of the life of St. Anthony of Padua, these mind portraits of today's saint dovetail perfectly with the story of his life and his sanctity. The first picture draws for us an accurate understanding of St. Anthony's deep spirituality, his purity and innocence, and his love for Christ, and the second illustrates his life's work as a preacher. But they are still life's black and white photos compared to the full story of his life in living color. It's the journey to sanctity that teaches us the most about saints and sanctity itself. Here is a small part of the moving picture of St. Anthony. Born in 1195, the only son of a wealthy Lisbon family, Ferdinand de Boulogne began his life a charmed and charming child of natural piety and intelligence. Supported by loving parents of pious bent, he graduated from the nearby Cathedral School of Lisbon at the age of 15, then applied for and was readily accepted into the Augustinian community at the Abbey of St. Vincent, just outside the city, in 1210. Finding the proximity to so many friends and family a deterrent to his focus on the spiritual life, though, young Ferdinand, within two years, requested to be transferred to the Monastery of the Holy Cross in Coimbra, which was at that time the capital of Portugal and 128 miles north of distraction. For eight years, he studied the prescribed courses of theology and languages, an obedient and diligent member of the community, ultimately rising to the honor and commitment of the holy priesthood. During this time in Coimbra, he became acquainted with the brand new Franciscan order through the small friary nearby, one dedicated in the name of St. Antony of the Desert. Immediately taken with the simplicity of the Franciscan mission, their love of poverty and care of the poor in body and soul, the young priest's heart was completely captured by the order when the bodies of five Franciscans martyred by the Muslims in Morocco, St. Bernard and Companions, the very first Franciscan martyrs, arrived in Coimbra in stately procession to be buried in their homeland. Burning with zeal for martyrdom himself, Father Ferdinand immediately and prayerfully began the sticky process of being released from the Augustinians so that he might possibly join the Franciscans, both ends of the endeavor requiring no small amount of diplomacy. The friars of St. Antony's agreed to his admittance first, under the provision that it was with the absolute convivial permission of the Augustinians at Holy Cross. With time, effort, Candid supplication and much prayer, permission was finally given, and Father Ferdinand received with his new habit the new name Anthony in honor of the monastery's patron. You can imagine with what joy St. Francis effected this transfer, assuming that the answer to this prayer meant it was God's will, as it was his own, that he sacrifice his life for the conversion of the Moors, and thus win the martyr's crown. His end goal must be God's end goal, right? Look out heaven, he must have thought, here I come. But as you know, St. Anthony did not die a martyr's death. Sorry, spoiler alert, but not really spoiled, surely. Even if you don't know the specifics of St. Anthony's life, you must know that because we call him saint, all was well as it ended. Even though it didn't go as St. Anthony hoped and planned. His was not to be the harsh but sure shortcut to heaven. Our holiest flights of fancy, as well-meaning as they might be, are featherless arrows. God knows better than we do how we can best serve him. 
And this St. Anthony found out the hard way, as many of us do. There he was on board ship, full of fire for love of God and his fellow man, expecting to land on hostile shores and labor for souls, interceding with the spilling of his own blood when all else failed. It was a pious, romantic, and you might even call it dramatic notion, one inconceivable to the worldly, but the fondest hope for those who want to follow Christ as closely as possible. And St. Anthony was ready to follow Christ, steeled and prayerful and sick. No sooner had he embarked than our saint was plagued with constant bouts of illness. Perhaps seasickness and it would pass, he thought. He would offer it up for the souls in Morocco and for courage to face his fate. But the ship docked and St. Anthony was still sick. His brother friars carried him to their lodgings in the seaside town, hoping that a few days' rest and stillness would bring him around. But he didn't improve. In between forays into the city and outlying districts, his brother friars nursed him, bringing with them tales of conversions and close calls dodging the infidels. So anxious to join them, St. Anthony willed himself to recover, praying ceaselessly, but no matter his determination, no matter the homely cures the friars attempted, he only grew more ill. After several months, having sent and received dispatches from the monastery of St. Anthony in Coimbra, much to his silent disappointment, St. Anthony was called home to Portugal. There would be no martyr's crown for this humble friar, no matter how much he wanted it. God had other plans, which didn't include returning to Coimbra. For reasons known to God and mysterious to St. Anthony at the time, it seemed that the plan was for him to be set down with a clean slate amongst people he didn't know and who had no preconceived notions of him. God accomplished this by causing a wild ride for St. Anthony while crossing the Mediterranean. Severe storms blew his ship far off course, landing ship and crew and St. Anthony in Sicily instead of Coimbra. Now, if you remember your geography, you are seeing exclamation points right now on the route you're picturing, as Sicily is located on the toe of Italy, while Coimbra is clear around on the mid-Atlantic coast of Portugal. About as far as he could get from his home monastery, poor bedraggled St. Anthony arrived 1,500 miles as the crow flies from home and clueless about what to do and where to go next. One thing seemed clear, though. He would probably die if he had to travel another mile on board a ship. So he set out across land, finally making his way from the toe of Sicily to Tuscany, near the knee of the boot, where, completely worn out, he was received into a house of the order. Taking into consideration his weakened state, the prior sent him to recover at the hermitage of San Paolo near Forli, eastward across the country and close to the sea at the top of the calf of the boot. Here, St. Anthony welcomed the peace of silence and prayer to recover body and soul and recommit himself to God's will. Undoubtedly, while he came to terms with the squashing of his own ideas of what glorious things he'd hoped to do for God that God didn't have in mind for him to do. As it so happened in 1222, at the age of 27, having served as the pastor for the hermitage at Forley for roughly a year, St. Anthony had cause to attend a gathering in Forley, where the Franciscan monastery hosted a group of Dominicans at the event of ordinations. The Dominicans apparently were expected to have amongst their rank a renowned speaker scheduled to give a sermon at a celebratory dinner afterward, but he had fallen ill, and no one else amongst the Dominicans had prepared for a sermon. The Franciscan abbot, loath to seem inhospitable by leaving such a gap in the proceedings, considered his own humble friars one by one and realized that none amongst them would be any more able to speak extemporaneously than the Dominicans. Then he remembered quiet, studious St. Anthony. Hadn't he been educated by the Augustinians? He was such a winning and earnest young man and wholly obedient. Perhaps, the abbot thought, young Anthony could at least bridge the gap and stand up for a few minutes. The Holy Ghost would surely aid him under the circumstances, and he would pray that it was so. And it was so. Though he was shy at first, 
the young friar soon became caught up in the spirit of his subject, and delivered a sermon with such zeal and tender piety, so inspiring in its depth and simplicity, that every one present, not least the prior who had pressed his obedience, was shocked that such a talented speaker had been hidden right in their midst. Word of St. Anthony's powerful preaching, of course, got back to St. Francis, and the rest, as they say, is history. Traveling the circuit of France and northern Italy, St. Anthony preached tirelessly, Fluent in Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, German, Greek, and Latin, he preached against the Albigensian heresy, gaining converts from amongst unbelievers and igniting fervor amongst believers. Known well by the designation Hammer of Heretics, his contemporaries nevertheless describe his sermons as being less condemning of evil as encouraging of good. He was wont to win souls through love of God and his holy mother than by threats. It could be said that he used the claw end of the hammer to remove nails as much as he used the pounding end to drive home truths. Traveler that he was, you may be wondering how St. Anthony, born in Lisbon, Portugal, ended up being famously known as Anthony of Padua, Italy. Though he did begin his speaking tours fairly soon upon his first renowned sermon in Forlì in 1224, St. Francis wrote to St. Anthony, quote, It pleases me that you should teach the friars sacred theology, provided that in such studies they do not destroy the spirit of holy prayer and devotedness as contained in the role. And so St. Anthony settled down a trifle in order to teach. His first assignment found him teaching his fellow Franciscans in Bologna, by St. Francis's death in 1226, St. Anthony had gained the trust and approbation of not only St. Francis himself, but of the order in general, and accepted the appointment of Provincial Superior of Northern Italy. Because Venice was a principal city of learning in the 13th century, St. Anthony made his home in nearby Padua, though he continued to travel widely, preaching and teaching, and caring for his beloved poor. It was in Padua, though, in 1231, that St. Anthony retired after receiving permission to relinquish his position as provincial superior due to failing health. He did reappear to assist in the administration of the order and on a couple notable occasions to preach in spite of his painful illness. It's estimated that 30,000 people came to Padua to hear his last sermon. The churches could not hold all the pilgrims, so St. Anthony went into the piazzas or the open fields. People waited all night to hear him. He needed a bodyguard to protect him from the people armed with scissors, trying to snip off pieces of his habit as relics. After his morning mass and sermon, he would hear confessions, which sometimes lasted all day, as did his fasting. During the Lent of 1231, St. Anthony made the short journey to a nearby town to preach, and greatly weakened by his expenditure of strength, and sensing his days were numbered, he began a slow and careful journey home to Padua. But he only made it as far as Arcella, a hamlet overlooking Padua, and then he could go no further. He lingered until June 13th, and piously recollected, he received extreme unction in Arcella, in his last hours, he sang and prayed with the friars there. When one of them asked St. Anthony what he was staring at so intently, he answered, I see my Lord, and died shortly thereafter. He was only 36 years old and had been a Franciscan for only 10 years. Still, he was known all over Italy and France. In the days and months after his holy death, stories of wonders surrounding St. Anthony's life and miracles after his death spread all over Christendom. But Pope Gregory IX was already well acquainted with the holiness of the young preaching Franciscan. It was he who had named him the Ark of the Covenant for the holy treasures of his preaching, and already convinced of his sanctity, did not hesitate to begin the process of his canonization. St. Anthony was one of the most quickly canonized saints in church history, entering the canon of the saints within only a year's time. He was proclaimed a doctor of the church by Pope Pius XII in January 1946. Now, what would a biography of St. Anthony be without including his most famous miracles? First, the story of fishes wiser than men. 
Unafraid to walk right into the den of lions to save souls, St. Anthony once traveled to the town of Rimini because he had heard it was a particular hotbed of heresy dictated by a rabid Albigensian town official. This despot, upon hearing that the famous preacher was headed his way intent on conversions, ordered the city gates to be closed against him and commanded the townspeople have nothing to do with him. Seeing which way the wind was blowing in Rimini, St. Anthony walked around the perimeter of the town until he happened upon the Mareccia River, near where it flows into the Adriatic Sea, and having found no one to listen to his preaching, turned his voice over the waters, saying, You fish of the river and sea, listen to the word of God, because the heretics do not wish to hear it. Suddenly there were thousands of fish, all pushing their heads through the surface of the water as if they were straining to listen. Now a child who happened to be nearby ran into Rimini, encouraging everyone he met to come and see the miracle. And amazed to witness this proof of God's blessing upon the humble friar, the townspeople were emboldened by St. Anthony's gentle holiness to disobey the dictates of the bitter Albigensian official, and the entire town was forthwith converted back to the true faith. Now, as many know, the church provides the blessing of bread on the Feast of St. Anthony, and like all old customs of the church, this blessing has its beginning in an event of olden days. The story of St. Anthony's bread is said to have begun in the year 1263, when a beloved child drowned near the Basilica of St. Anthony. The child's mother prayed for St. Anthony's intercession and promised that if the child was restored to her, she would give the child's weight in grain to the poor in order that they could make bread, a very great gift in a time of widespread poverty and hunger. When the child was miraculously restored to life, the woman was true to her word, and the tradition of giving alms to the poor in St. Anthony's name was begun. It's a beautiful tradition of generosity and charity to the poor, and fitting that is done in St. Anthony's name, since he is the patron saint of the poor. St. Anthony is also known as the guardian of the male, as a result of another incident of his life. Our gentle saint always sought solitude and time for prayer and reflection, but was so popular a preacher, teacher, and confessor that he rarely found time for rest. Once, feeling as if he'd reached the end of his reserves, he wrote to his superior for permission for a small vacation and time to travel some distance away for reflection. As the story goes, however, when the messenger arrived for the letter intended for St. Anthony's superior, it was nowhere to be found. St. Anthony took this as a sign that it was not God's will for him to go and forgot about the trip. Imagine his surprise when shortly afterward he received a letter from his superior granting his permission. Another legend recorded in the 1790s bears witness to this patronage. In an age long before the miraculous instant means of communication we call the Internet, a heartbroken wife sought news of her husband who had traveled from Spain to Peru. Despite having written to him repeatedly, she'd received no answer and feared the worst. In desperation, she went to the chapel and placed a letter in the hands of the statue of St. Anthony, praying he would intercede on her behalf and assist with its delivery. The next day, when she returned to the chapel, she was disappointed and a little embarrassed to see her letter still there in so obvious a place. She reached up to take the letter back and realized immediately her husband's handwriting on the missive instead of her own. To her astonishment, he'd written that her letter had been delivered by a Franciscan priest and that he had been overjoyed to receive it as he had thought her dead since not hearing from her for so long. Now, how about the image of St. Anthony holding the Christ child in his arms? And why is he so often pictured with lilies? In many places, along with St. Anthony's bread, lilies are blessed and distributed on the Feast of St. Anthony. The lily, of course, symbolizes St. Anthony's purity and our own need to pray for the grace of purity in times of temptation. These fragrant flowers make a connection with one of our saint's most famous miracles in that St. Anthony's lily-white purity permitted the miracle of the Christ child that artists are so fond of capturing. There are many slightly differing versions of the legend of St. Anthony cradling the Christ child. In most, St. Anthony had traveled to a local hermitage to spend time in meditation. 
One night, while deep in prayer, Jesus appeared to him as a child, the room flooding with light as St. Anthony held the Christ child in his arms. As the story is told, the friar of the hermitage, upon seeing the light, came to investigate, and on spying through a crack in the door, beheld the holy scene. When the vision ended, St. Anthony realized the friar was kneeling in awe at the door and begged him not to share the story until after St. Anthony's death, a promise the friar kept. Shortly after our saint's death, however, at the process of canonization, the friar's account became widespread, and the simplicity of its proof of the holiness of St. Anthony has lived in our Catholic hearts through an entire millennia. Now you know I can't sign off without mentioning St. Anthony's universal claim to fame, his mission as the finder of lost items. Have you ever wondered how today's saint became the go-to saint of the absent-minded? Here's the legend. St. Anthony had a favorite book of Psalms that was very valuable to him. As this was before the invention of printing, the Psalter was hand-printed, but of even more value were the personal notes and the comments St. Anthony had made in the Psalter to assist with teaching students in the Franciscan order. Saddest of all, it was suspected that a novice leaving the community had stolen the valuable book. Anthony, of course, prayed for the return of his beloved possession and for the soul of the absconding friar. And you guessed it, shortly thereafter the novice returned the book and sought Anthony's forgiveness, which he of course gave. And last but not least, novenas to St. Anthony are popularly celebrated throughout the world, traditionally beginning on Tuesdays, as Tuesday was the day St. Anthony was buried and the miracles at his tomb began. The popularity of novenas to St. Anthony is linked to a story of a childless couple. After many years of longing for a child, the wife took her troubles to St. Anthony. He is said to have appeared to her in a dream, telling her, quote, For nine Tuesdays, one after the other, make visits to the Franciscan chapel and approach the holy sacraments of penance and the altar. Then pray, and what you ask for, you shall obtain. The couple soon had a child and the account, together with the instructions for the novena, were shared and shared and shared, with so many happy outcomes that the efficacy of the prayers spread quickly. In 1898, Pope Leo XIII encouraged this devotion by granting a plenary indulgence to those spending time in devout prayer in honor of St. Anthony, with the intention of doing so for nine consecutive Tuesdays. But you don't have to wait for Tuesdays to pray to St. Anthony. And though it's nice to end a novena on the feast day of the saint to whom we petition, it isn't necessary, and a prayer put off is just time wasted. You can begin this novena to St. Anthony at any time and expect great things. And here is the novena to St. Anthony. O white lily of purity, sublime example of poverty, true mirror of humility, resplendent star of sanctity, O glorious St. Anthony, who didst enjoy the sweet privilege of receiving into thy arms the infant Jesus, I beseech thee to take me under thy powerful protection. Thou in whom the power of working miracles shines forth among the other gifts of God, have pity upon me and come to my aid in this my great need. Mention your intention here. Cleanse my heart from every disorderly affection. Obtain for me a true contrition for my sins and a great love of God and of my neighbor, that serving God faithfully in this life, I may come to praise, enjoy, and bless him eternally with thee in paradise. Amen. Then recite one Our Father, one Hail Mary, and one Glory Be. St. Anthony, pray for us. And happy blessed name day to Sister Maria Antonia. You've been listening to the Catholic Family Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. You can support the production on Patreon and PayPal, and you can reach Kevin at kevin89davis at gmail.com. Ad maiorem de gloriam. All for the greater glory of God. <laughs>